So today I'll be uh, sharing with you some of the research we're doing in my group, uh, generally in the context of uh, atomic dynamics in materials, especially materials for energy applications. And so uh, this picture I want to start with is to remind you about uh, the fact that atoms make up materials and they have certain arrangements inside of materials. They don't arrange randomly. Typically, they like to have orderly arrangements in crystalline materials, which you can liken to these um, uh, stackings of fruits here in those boxes. And so this is all fine and well. This may describe uh, the ground state structure of the material at very low temperature. But something we have to keep in mind is that at finite temperature, there's kinetic energy in the system and thus the atoms vibrate around. And so if you look at these fruits, you might think, if you're a farmer and you just pick those fruits and put them uh, in these boxes, and you put them at the back of your truck and you drive down some dirt road, so it's going to shake around, and the question is, what's going to happen? Which arrangements of atoms are going to remain stable, mechanically stable, or thermodynamically stable? So these are some of the questions we like to investigate. And this is important in a broader context of uh, the energy usage in our society and how materials can help us achieve a more sustainable economy. So this chart is compiled every year by Lawrence Livermore National Lab and it shows us what happens to the energy that enters the economic uh, system. So we've got all these various sources of energy and they go into different processes, they get converted between different types of energy. Uh, but something important to keep in mind is that more than half of the energy that comes in is actually rejected in the form of heat largely, so it's lost energy. And so if we could have better materials and better transfer um, processes, then we could improve the efficiency of our overall economy and achieve a more sustainable society. So in this context, the grand challenge is to arrive at a better understanding of atomic dynamics and atomic vibrations in those materials and to understand how these atomic vibrations impact the functional properties of these energy materials. With this better understanding, ultimately, we can achieve control of the atomic dynamics inside of the materials and improve the properties of the materials. So I'm illustrating here a couple of applications uh, where our research directly ties into. So for example, it's very important to understand thermal transport at the atomic scale inside of um, integrated circuits such as computer chips uh, because the heat release inside of the computer chips is really limiting nowadays, uh, for example, the clock cycle that we, can, that we can have in our CPUs. Understanding thermal transport is also extremely important in the context of nuclear fuel. Uh, this is limiting actually the operations of nuclear power plants. Now, as Stefan indicated earlier, we're very interested in thermoelectric materials. These thermoelectric materials are used frequently in those Peltier coolers coolers, they can be used to refrigerate systems uh, without any me mechanical moving parts, which is an advantage. They can also be used to actually capture waste heat and generate electricity by a reverse process. And so they could be used in principle, and there are some demonstrations out there already, uh, in the tailpipe of an automobile to recuperate some of the uh, waste heat going down the tailpipe and perhaps replace the alternator, for example. They've also been used for a number of years in the NASA space program to power space probes that are too far away from the sun to utilize solar panels. So currently they're used in those so-called radioisotope thermal generators uh, to power the Mars Curiosity rover on the surface of Mars, for example. And actually one of the materials I'll describe later in the talk is currently used in this Mars Curiosity rover. And in terrestrial applications, there's a lot of interest to actually use these thermoelectric materials to harvest some of the heat radiated by the sun so you could have a little bit similar to a photovoltaic, but instead of capturing the uh, visible part of the light, you uh, harvest the heat, the heat with an absorber and drive a temperature gradient, which you can then utilize to generate electricity with a rather cheap and robust thermoelectric module. So these are examples of applications. There are other types of materials uh, really relying on the atomic dynamics and the motions of the atoms. You can think of uh, materials for energy storage, battery materials. So you may know that in lithium batteries, you need to let the lithium ions move around between the cathode and the anode. Uh, but nowadays we're using liquid electrolytes and that's been a little bit of a safety concern because these liquid electrolytes are combustible and lead to some uh, failure, dangerous uh, failures of these lithium batteries. So there's a push nowadays to replace these liquid electrolytes with 
solid state versions of them. So you have a solid in which the lithium atom can zip around, and if you can optimize this process, then you can achieve better and safer batteries. Another type of material that uh, relies on the atomic dynamics and changes in configurations of atoms are the so-called phase change materials, which are used for information storage. So for example, this germanium antimony telluride is a material that can switch between a crystalline state and a amorphous state here. This is similar to a glass. Uh, when you hit it with a laser, you give it a short pulse of heat, and it goes back and forth between those two states. And this lets you uh, uh, record some bits on the surface of a Blu-ray disc. This is equivalent to a more modern version of a DVD, say. So to understand this process, we also need to understand the thermodynamics of these different configurations. And the atomic vibrations are key to understand these processes. So next, I want to give you a little bit more detail about how we can describe these atomic vibrations in solids. And this is what we call phonons. So we've got some animations here um, of a very simplistic model of a, uh, a diatomic crystal, so just blue and red balls. And there are different types of modes that this crystalline lattice can suspend. So if you have more of a mechanical engineering background, you may be used to doing um, you know, structural dynamics, vibrations of structures. This is exactly the same problem, except now the structure is of atomic dimensions. And so there are different types of eigen modes that the structure can have. You can have these compressive sound waves propagating through the crystal. This is a, what we call a longitudinal acoustic phonon, just like sound, really. And then there's this other type of mode I'm illustrating here. This is more of a shear motion of the atoms perpendicular to the direction of propagation of the wave. So it's called a transverse mode. And you also notice that the blue and the red atoms are actually vibrating out of phase with one another. Uh, and so it is not an acoustic mode. This is what we call an optic mode. And there are many other types of vibrations you can imagine. And in the end, we can superimpose all of these different modes and so at a given temperature, we populate those modes according to Bose-Einstein statistics, and we recover this thermal jitter. And this is the concept of heat here. So fine. Um, these are just to illustrate basically the concept of phonons, but there are also um, two important concepts to take away from this. The first one is that phonons are really critical to understand the transport of energy, so to understand the atomistic origin of thermal conductivity in materials. And the other aspect is that these atomic vibrations of phonons contribute a lot to the disorder in the material, so they're a big source of entropy. And for that reason, they're critical to understand thermodynamics. Actually, phonons are the dominant source of entropy in most solids at uh, ambient temperature. So now to give you a little bit more detail about how we might uh, describe these phonons or atomic vibrations in solids, let me present you here a picture I'm sure some of you are already familiar with, and it is that of the uh, quantum harmonic oscillator. So we won't go into a lot of the math in details, but the idea is quite simple. If you can describe the potential energy surface that the atoms feel inside the solid, and you expand it around the equilibrium configuration by doing a Taylor expansion, which you truncate the quadratic order, then you have something that is uh, like this parabolic well for the vibrations of the atoms. And so in quantum mechanics, this is one of the simplest cases we can actually treat. Uh, so this is quantum harmonic oscillator. We know that the energy levels in the system are quantized and given by this expression. n plus 1 half times h bar omega, where omega is the fundamental frequency of our oscillator. And so we might say that the oscillator is in the n equals 4 excited state. Uh, in a phonon language, we would say that we've got four phonons of this type occupied. So now the question is, you know, what kind of frequencies are we dealing with here? So we're looking at atoms. The masses are very light. And as a result, the frequencies are quite high. Uh, atomic frequencies are on the range of terahertz, 10 to the 12 hertz. So they've been challenging to measure for some time. But nowadays, we have very powerful experimental techniques, which enable us to resolve those vibrations in great detail. And we can also compute them directly from first principles methods. And so in our group, we do both experiments and simulations. I'll explain how we go about uh, tracking those phonon vibrations. In a little bit more detail, there's this um, picture that is important to have in mind here. Namely, this is describing what we call dispersion relations. This is uh, translating the fact that the vibration frequencies omega that I just talked about 
depend on the wavelengths of the particular modes we're considering. So omega is a function of k, and the slopes of these dispersion relations are giving us the propagation velocities for the waves in the crystal. So they're very important to understand the thermal transport. So we need to be able to characterize these phonon dispersion relations in real materials in order to really understand thermal transport at this atomistic level. When we're concerned primarily with the thermodynamics, we may not need to measure all of this, and we can just integrate over the wave vectors and focus on the phonon spectrum or phonon density of states. And I'll get back to this in some examples. It's important to keep in mind that nowadays we can fully characterize this dispersion, dispersion, dispersion relations, I'm sorry, and um, phonon density of states experimentally using, for example, neutron scattering, X-ray scattering, optical spectroscopy. So we combine those techniques in my group. And we also use first principles uh, computer simulations, so quantum mechanical simulations on the computer, uh, to predict those quantities and compare with their measurements. <clears throat> so the picture I presented here was in the harmonic approximation, but I'd like to emphasize that this is often too simplistic an approximation. And actually, to understand thermal transport, we need to go beyond that picture. We need to consider higher order terms in the atom interatomic potentials. Uh, so this is deviations from the parabolic behavior. And this is really the source of a number of important functional properties of materials, namely the thermal resistivity as well as thermal expansion. And so I'll give some illustrations in a couple of materials. But first, let me uh, tell you a little bit about how we, how we can do measurements of these phonons in materials using neutrons or x-rays. We tend to use uh, both of them. And so our group often goes on these uh, field trips where we fly to various uh, sources across the country to use these powerful sources. I tend to have... Uh, a little bit of a preference for neutrons. They're kind of near and dear to my heart, but we can use both, really. Uh, so conceptually, how we do the experiment is fairly simple. Of course, we need a beam of either neutrons or x-rays, and they need to have wavelengths comparable to the interatomic distances in the samples, so angstroms. And we need to be able to detect energy transfers between these probing particles or waves and or phonons or other types of excitations which are on the scale of uh, terahertz, which is the same as milli-electron volts. So if we have such a beam of particles and we put a sample inside of the beam, then what we do is we collect particles that are scattered, namely they don't just go straight through, but they come out at a different angle, and maybe with a different final energy. So we can record both the scattering angle and the energy transfer. And so this technique is, uh, in the case of neutron scattering, was pioneered by these two gentlemen uh, Cliff Shaw and Bertrand Brockhaus, who uh, received the Nobel Prize in Physics in '94 for their work. So, of course, we need beams of neutrons, uh, beams of X-rays to do the, our experiments. And so we travel to these uh, really fancy scientific user facilities um, scattered about the country. So one of the facilities we like to use a lot, uh, and that's partly why I've got this joint appointment with Oak Ridge, is this Spallation Neutron Source. This is a relatively new facility that opened in the early 2000s, uh, most powerful neutron source in the world with an extremely powerful suite of instruments to do a number of different types of materials characterizations. Um, we also use the uh, nuclear reactor at NIST that's in Gaithersburg, close to Washington, D.C. So it's nice that we're strategically located sort of halfway between Oak Ridge and, uh, and Washington, D.C., actually, here at Duke. We also use the X-rays coming out of the synchrotrons, in particular the advanced photon source at Oregon National Lab. And I'll show you some data coming out of the synchrotron uh, with an inelastic X-ray spectrometer. And then more recently, we've been using this uh, really exciting free electron laser here. Uh, this is the LINAC current light source at SLAC next to Stanford, which gives us temporal resolution on the order of femtoseconds. But let me illustrate. Um, the types of data we can get out of these instruments nowadays. And this is in the case of a neutron spectrometer. So <clears throat> this is uh, actually an animation. Um, so let me describe a little bit how this works. So this is the scattering intensity mapped out in the uh, what we call the reciprocal space of the sample. So this is the space of the spatial periodicities of the crystal. So this is the Fourier space, if you will, of the, uh, the crystal, which is denoted HKNL. And then there's a fourth dimension, which is 
the Fourier transform of time, so the energy of the vibrations or the frequency of the vibrations. So, so I'm going to play this so you can see how the intensity in this reciprocal space changes as a function of the uh, energy of vibrations we're looking at. So it looks a little bit complicated, uh, but you can see like this regions that start at bright spots then grow bigger, and this is related to the dispersion relations, but really the message here is that we, we come out of the experiments with big data sets, and there's really a lot to do with them, and the computations really are quite handy in order to analyze what we've looked at, and actually there's um, really good opportunities to do more detailed analysis and to use um, high-performance computing and advanced analysis methods to really get the most out of these data sets. And so one of the things that we do in order to understand our experiments is principle simulations based on density functional theory. And the idea is the following. Um, so in order to understand the atomic vibrations, we want to know what are the forces on these atoms that drive them. And the atomic nuclei feel the electrons in the solid, which give a, an attractive force. So we need to know this electronic density throughout the solid. And we also need to know the position of the other ions, which give a repulsive force. But the important and um, the big simplification, actually, within the framework of quantum mechanics uh, was derived by uh, Richard Feynman uh, when he was an undergraduate student, actually, and published this in Physical Review. Uh, the force on the nuclei inside of the solid is actually given by the same expression you'd have in classical mechanics, so electrostatic forces, <coughs> provided that you know the electronic density distribution inside of your material. So if you, can kill it, if you can calculate this electronic density, then you can work out the forces on each and every nucleus inside of your material. So nowadays we do this using density functional theory, and it's become a really quite amazingly accurate. So we can do direct comparisons between the dispersions that we get from our measurements and our simulations, and that is illustrated on this slide. So on the left here, I'm showing you a slice through the previous four-dimensional data set coming from neutron scattering, illustrating these phonon uh, arches here. These are acoustic phonon dispersions in this particular material, iron, silica, iron silicide. So this is the measurement on the left. And then on the right is a, a calculation uh, we've done using a standard um, density functional theory uh, package called VASP. And then we had to write some codes to actually calculate the cross-section to match them directly. But you can see that uh, both the, the frequency of these phonon excitations and the intensities of the signal are quite nicely reproduced in the simulations. So this is a, extremely useful because you can see there's a lot of details in the measurements here. And in order, in order to fully understand uh, where these intensities are coming from, we, we need to have some model to do some comparisons with. And we can do the cuts in many different directions in this big data set. So, so we can have a lot of fun slicing and dicing through the data. And there's a, a push nowadays to, to really try and integrate the simulations with the experiments to really make the most out of these instruments. Access to these instruments is uh, not easy. You need to make beam time requests, and you have a limited number of days each time. So you really want to try and do the best you can. And so what we're trying to develop is actually uh, this idea of concurrent simulations and experiments, where you can run the uh, first principle simulations on some uh, large-scale computing infrastructure, uh, such as this, this cluster at Oak Ridge National Lab here. This is not the biggest one they've got, but they, they, uh, they can give us access to the full cluster here while we're doing an experiment so that we can do a, a large ab initio molecular dynamic simulation and directly compare it with our measurement and help that to actually steer the experiment to make the most of our beam time. So there are uh, important opportunities to push this paradigm further here. So at this point, I've given you a little bit of background on the types of tools that we use for both our experiments and our simulations. And I wanted to uh, tell you a little bit about some uh, exciting results we've gotten in a couple of materials over the past several years. Um, so the first one I wanted to describe is vanadium dioxide. So this is a material we've investigated now for a couple of years. Uh, it's a very <coughs> peculiar material. It goes through a, a very strange phase transition just above room temperature, which was discovered about 60 years ago, but still remains a big controversy. So it's a very simple 
uh, chemical structure, you might think, but it's actually very fascinating in the types of properties that it displays. So let me explain to you what uh, is happening in this material and why phonons are actually interesting. Uh, but actually, before I do that, let me uh, show you some possible applications also of this material. So this material uh, goes through a transition between an insulating state at room temperature and a metallic state above 68 degrees Celsius. Uh, it does that reversibly uh, just by changing the temperature. And so people are thinking of using that to coat windows with a thin film of this material such that when the window sees a lot of radiation from the sun, it eats up and it could automatically transform into the metallic phase, which then becomes more opaque to the infrared radiation and doesn't let as much heat through the window. So this is a passive regulation mechanism for windows in uh, controlling the temperature of buildings. Another aspect of this phase transition, which is very important, is that it is an ultra-fast phase transition. It happens on a time scale of about 100 femtoseconds or less. We don't know exactly how fast it is. Uh, we're still trying to find that out. Uh, but as a result, it could be used to make some very fast transistors if you can switch between a metal and an insulating phase very quickly. And so we've, we've published a couple of uh, papers on this, and there's this, this pair of papers that I'll be uh, telling you a little bit about. So this first one was... Uh, investigating the, the role of the phonons atomic vibrations in understanding the thermodynamics of this phase transition. And then this more recent paper that came out just uh, two weeks ago is to understand the, the change in thermal conductivity across this phase transition, which was also a very uh, unusual behavior and kind of surprising result. So here's a slide to um, convey to you what is happening across this phase transition. So on the, right, on the left-hand side here, we have a temperature scale. And the bottom structure shows what is the arrangement of atoms on average over time in this low temperature, low symmetry phase, which we call M1 for monoclinic. This is a lower symmetry phase. And that's insulating. So the electrons cannot flow through this phase. And then when we heat up across the phase transition, we have a different arrangement of atoms that sets in. Uh, and this is a higher symmetry configuration. It is a tetragonal phase called rutile, or R for short, and this phase is metallic. And you can go back and forth between those two phases by changing temperature. So at the same time as the atoms rearrange themselves, uh, the electronic transport changes with them. So you become insulating at the same time as the atoms get displaced. And you can notice the types of distortions that are happening here. In particular, if you look at these this blue balls here that are the vanadium ones, so you see that they are equidistant along the, the C direction, so the vertical direction of the uh, root high structure here in the high temperature phase. But when you cool down, they adopt this kind of zigzag pattern with some shorter bonds and longer bonds, which is akin to what's known as a pyrrhous uh, dimerization of the chains of vanadium atoms here. And so <clears throat> it, it may not be uh, obvious to you yet why the atomic vibrations matter here, but um, let me justify uh, why we need to understand the atomic vibrations. So we're trying to understand what is driving this phase transition and why you can switch between these two phases. And so in order to do that, you need to understand the thermodynamics of these two phases. You need to understand what we call the free energy, and you need to see how the free energy changes across the phase transition. So you can construct the difference in the two free energies of these two phases. And at the phase transition temperature, uh, they will be the same. So the difference is 0. You can measure the difference in the enthalpy here with a calorimetry experiment. So this quantity has been known for some time. And so since you know this and you know the temperature of the phase transition, you can back out what is the change in entropy across the phase transition. So that has been known, that number. But what was not known is what is really contributing this entropy, this phase transition. Because I just told you that the behavior of the electrons change. You go from an insulator to a metal. In the metal, you've got more electronic entropy than in an insulator. Uh, the structure also changes at the same time, so the atomic vibrations might change. So you do not know a priori what is contributing the entropy. Is it the change in the phonons, or is it the change in the electrons? 
So this is the question we solved in this first study. And I'll show you that the funnel is actually the dominant contribution to the entropy of this phase transition. And so we started investigating, investigating this problem by doing some um, X-ray diffraction types of measurements at the synchrotron. I'm showing you here some of the data on the left. You've got, um, this is intensity from X-ray scattering. So this is not probing the dynamics yet, it's just the average structure in the high temperature phase, the rutile, and the low temperature phase at the bottom. And you can see that, okay, there are changes in those sharp peaks here. These are called the Bragg spots, and those tell us about the average periodicity in the two structures. So, so the changes in the Bragg spots, that's already known because we already know what the structures are. But another effect we notice is that between those Bragg peaks, I'm sorry, between those Bragg peaks, there's also this diffuse streak, which is only present in the high temperature rutile metallic phase and not in the low temperature M1 phase. And so Actually, this trick here, which is much fainter, uh, but also where we produced in our simulations, this comes from the funnels. This is what we call thermal diffuse scattering. And by including this effect in our first principles calculations, we can neatly reproduce uh, how this is present in the high temperature metallic phase and not in the insulating phase. So this first experiment, even though it was not energy resolved, was already telling us that something is happening to the funnels contributing this extra signal. And so then the question was like, well, you know, let's do some spectroscopy to understand how the atomic vibrations are really changing. So in order to do that, we did neutron scattering measurements using a, a powerful spectrometer at Oak Ridge National Lab, which is illustrated here. Uh, I won't go into uh, all the details of how this works, but I just want to emphasize that these are large instruments. The scale of the detector bank is three meters tall, and it's about four meters from the sample. So uh, this is filling up an entire room, and this is actually inside of a vacuum chamber. So you're sitting on top of a lot of uh, energy stored in evacuating this large chamber here. And on the right uh, are two postdocs uh, in my group who uh, are involved in these types of measurements. And actually, uh, our students are also learning how to do these measurements now. And to, uh, so what they're doing here, they are loading the sample inside of this vacuum chamber. The sample sits at the uh, end of this stick here. Uh, to give you the, the better sense of scale, this, this flange here that they're sitting on top of, which is closing the vacuum chamber, is actually seen here at the top. So they're inserting the sample in the vacuum chamber, and the neutrons go through them, and they might transfer energy with the, the sample or not, and we can measure a spectrum of vibration uh, with this technique. So we measure the phonon spectrum in the two phases. The results of the experiment are shown here at the top. The metallic phase is in red, and the insulator phase is in black. And then we also do the first principles calculations to calculate the phonon spectrum and do a direct comparison. Uh, amazingly, the agreement is pretty good. It was actually fairly tricky to get the phonon spectrum in the metallic phase, uh, but we reproduced the trend quite well. So you can see that there's a big shift going from the insulating phase in black to the metallic phase in red, where the phonon frequencies in the metal are lower. So the phonon spectrum shifts to lower frequencies. And this is also seen in the simulation here. So it tells us that the bonding changes significantly between those two phases, impacting the vibration frequencies of the atoms. And this turns out to be pretty important for the entropy of the material. I'll get back to uh, how this contributes to the entropy in a little bit. Now, I also want to show you that um, in the calculations, we can understand where this lower vibration frequencies come from. We can compute the interatomic potential uh, the potential energy surface for different patterns of vibrations of atoms in those two phases. The top two panels are representing the uh, cuts to the potential energy surface for these types of vibrations. And you can see that, uh, so the calculated values are the red dots. And you can see that they are not quite harmonic. They don't fall on top of a parabola. So uh, we call this phase unharmonic. Now, in the insulating phase, they do fall on a parabolic line much better. So the low temperature phase is much more harmonic. And because it's got this sort of a flat bottom in the case of the metallic phase, the vibration frequencies will be lower. So this is what's contributing the shift in the funnel spectrum between the two phases. So now using this, this funnel spectra, we can evaluate the entropy contribution 
uh, of the phonons in the two phases and compare that to what was known based on the prior calorimetry measurements. So we take the difference in entropy coming from the phonons in the two phases here, going from the M1 to the R phase, and we see that the entropy increases in the high temperature phase. Maybe that's no surprise. But uh, we also see what is the actual number. So there's 0.3 uh, kb per atom extra entropy in the metallic phase, where one Boltzmann constant per atom is equivalent to uh, the ideal gas constant R for a mole of atoms. So that's uh, so 3 kb per atom would be 25 joules per mole per Kelvin, so in the Dulong Petit limit. So you see that the phonons are contributing uh, 0.3 kb per atom. Uh, this is in good agreement in both our experiments and our simulations. And if we compare that to the non-total entropy change across the phase transition, which is about 0.5, you see that the phonons are actually contributing about two-thirds of the entropy change at the phase transition. So they are the dominant uh, players in terms of understanding the thermodynamic stabilization of this metallic phase at high temperature. We can compare that to the role of the electrons here. So this was taken from the literature. This was evaluated based on uh, some experimental data, transport data. And then we can also evaluate the electronic entropy based on the electronic density of states that we get out of the DFT simulations. We have fairly good agreement here as well. And you can see that Indeed, the electrons contribute only about one-third of what the phonons contribute. So clearly, the atomic vibrations are important to understand this phase transition and how the metallic phase gets stabilized at high temperature. So of course, there's kind of a flip side to this, right? Uh, if you only have the phonons and the phonons stabilize the high temperature phase, then why do you have a low temperature phase, right? There has to be a competition. So at low temperature, you have uh, an energy stabilization in the M1 insulating phase, there's opening of a band gap, and this is really driven by the electrons. So the electrons and the phonons compete where the electrons want to favor this insulating phase at low temperature, which has lower energy but also lower entropy, and the phonons want to favor the metallic phase, which has a higher entropy, and so that's the stable one at high temperature. So this was the, the main result of this uh, first study. And then recently, we, um, we started to ask ourselves, you know, can we understand the thermal transport across the phase transition in this material? So the thermal conductivity was measured by our collaborators at um, UC Berkeley and Berkeley National Lab in these uh, vanadium dioxide nanobeams here. So we've got this um, thin nanobeam of vanadium dioxide that's uh, deposited on this uh, heater and uh, sensor pads here uh, in vacuum. And so you can heat this up and, you know, record the temperature change on the other side to understand what is the, the heat carried across and thus get the thermal conductivity. You can also measure the electrical resistivity at the same time. And the data are shown on the right-hand side here. So, so remember when we go across this phase transition at 340 Kelvin, we go from the insulating phase to the metallic phase, so the electrical conductivity jumps up by several orders of magnitude, go from the insulator to the metal. And of course, the electrons can contribute to the heat transport, so you might expect you should see a big jump in the thermal conductivity across the phase transition. But actually, you do not, so that is really surprising behavior, if you measure the total thermal conductivity across the phase transition here, you only see this tiny blip. Knowing what the change in electrical conductivity is at the phase transition, you can work out what would be expected for the change in electronic thermal conductivity using what's called the wiedemann fons law. And so knowing this change in uh, electrical conductivity here, you can work out the electronic thermal conductivity, and it should give you a boost of about seven watts per meter per Kelvin. But instead, you only see a tiny blip of 10 times less than this. So what happened? Like, how come the electrons are not contributing more thermal conductivity? Where does this go? So, so in order to understand this, you need to separate out the contribution of the phonons and the electrons to the total thermal conductivity of the system. And that's where our phonon measurements played a critical part. And so in order to understand the phonon thermal transport, we had to measure the phonon dispersions. And we only have pretty small crystals, a little bit larger than the ones I showed earlier, but still pretty small. 
as shown here on the 200 microns across. And uh, it's hard to do neutron scattering on such small samples, so we had to use the x-rays in spade for this experiment. So we traveled to the synchrotron in Chicago, and uh, we did inelastic x-ray scattering experiments. This is the, uh, the instrument illustrated on the left here. It's got this very large two-theta arm that uh, rotates around to get different scattering angles. The sample is mounted at the center of this four-cycle goniometer here. Uh, there's a zoomed-in view here with the sample mounted at the end of this cooling or heating device. And this is zoomed in again here to see the size of the crystal. The X-ray beam itself is about 30 microns across. You can look at pretty tiny samples. And here are some of the data coming out of these types of experiments. So you can see that we can fairly well map out these phonon dispersion relations energy as, function, as a function of wave vector in different directions in the reciprocal space. We don't get quite the big four-dimensional maps that we get in scattering, but the upside is that we can measure tiny samples. Yeah. So we, we collect these phonon dispersions, and from the slopes of them, we can know the good velocities. So this is how we get to the thermal transport question uh, in this material. And we also do the first principles calculations to compare with the measurement, and we get pretty quantitative agreement. So we can understand the bonding pretty well. So if we compare now the phonon dispersions between the two phases, uh, we see that there's a quite big reorganization. It looks a little bit complicated when you look at all the details of the dispersions. Uh, the key point is that there's sort of a canceling effect, actually, uh, between the good velocities of the slopes of the dispersion and the lifetimes of the phonons. Um, so uh, in the uh, metallic phase, you've got a smaller unit cell, so you have fewer dispersion branches, whereas in the insulating phase, you've got a larger unit cell, you've got many optic modes which are pretty flat <coughs> and do not propagate fast, so they don't carry a lot of heat. Um, so this, uh, this kind, of, kind of balances out, and so in the end, the change in the phonon contribution to the thermal conductivity is not very big. So this tells us that if the phonon don't change so much, and the total doesn't change so much, then it must be that the electronic part of the thermal conductivity is not that big. And so it is really much smaller than it would be expected to be based on this uh, proportionality with the electrical conductivity. So this is a case where this wiedemann franz law is strongly violated, uh, even above room temperature. And this was really the surprising um, conclusion in this, in this study. So uh, wrapping up a little bit the discussion on vanadium dioxide here, uh, I hope I uh, conveyed to you that understanding the microscopic thermodynamics is important to understand the phase transition, that you really need to understand the atomic vibrations of phonons in order to be able to do that. And this is also what's needed to understand the nanoscale thermal transport. Question. Yes? Yes, yeah, so uh, we have some model in this, in this paper. Uh, I, I have to say that uh, it's pretty complex, but the idea is that it is not the typical uh, type of transport behavior where you might think of the electrons um, as a gas and kind of heating atoms over electrons and getting scattered, that this is more of a collective behavior of electrons, like a sort of a, a flow, uh, perhaps associated to the more um, correlated nature of the electrons in the system. So, um, so now I'll be shifting focus a little bit to talk about phonons in thermoelectric materials. So these thermoelectric materials, uh, I, I introduced a little bit in the uh, introduction already. They can be used in a variety of applications. And so the, um, the question is, how can we understand uh, really at the atomistic level the origin of the thermal conductivity of these materials? And here I want to uh, directly show you that the thermal conductivity controls the efficiency in these materials for the thermoelectric conversion process. So the thermoelectric conversion efficiency is quantified by what we call the uh, figure of merit ZT, which is uh, what is temperature here, is just to keep things eight-dimensional. And it's given by the ratio of electronic properties and thermal properties of the denominator, uh, or thermal transport properties, I should say. And so at the numerator, you've got the product of electrical conductivity and uh, Seebeck coefficient squares. So 
This is telling you what is the electrical power coming from having a voltage differential, uh, I'm sorry, a temperature differential across your material. And so you can understand that, well, first of all, looking at the expression, we want to have a low thermal conductivity to maximize this in order to have a more efficient thermoelectric material. Uh, but more intuitively, you may ask yourself, why do we need to have this low thermal conductivity? It's quite simple. You're trying to use a temperature differential to generate a voltage to the Seebeck effect to generate electricity. So you want to preserve this temperature differential. So you want to have a heat insulator preventing the heat from leaking across, so to speak. So you need to have this low thermal conductivity, so you need to prevent the phonons from, propagate, from propagating across the material. So you need to scatter the phonons and suppress this thermal conductivity here. So in order to understand how to scatter the phonons, you need to learn something about you know, what is scattering phonons in materials and how much different phonon modes contribute to the overall thermal conductivity. So you need to break down this, this thermal conductivity here from the phonons in terms of its uh, different contributions. So for every single phonon mode, so think about the longitudinal acoustic mode we had in the beginning or transverse optic mode, each one of those contributes to the thermal conductivity, but you don't know how much each one contributes. And the way you find out is by considering the good velocity of how they propagate and how far they propagate or how long they propagate between scattering events. So you need to know these good velocities and these phonon lifetimes. And if you can measure that or compute that for every single phonon mode in your crystal, then you can build up the total thermal conductivity, which you might measure in the lab. But in the process, you really get a microscopic understanding of how this happens. So this is the question we're trying to solve here. And experimentally, uh, we do the neutron or X-ray scattering measurement to get the phonon dispersions. That gives us the slopes, so the good velocities. And then the way we get to the lifetimes is by uh, looking at the distribution in energy of a single phonon. So here we would take a cut across this dispersion, get a little peak. And the width of this peak is a direct measure of the lifetime of the phonon. So the lifetime is you know, how many oscillations your phonon goes through before it decays. So we can collect these lifetimes for all the different possible phonon modes, and then we build up this total thermal conductivity. Uh, but in the process, we also learn about what is scattering the phonons based on the behaviors of these lifetimes. And so one of the uh, first materials that we looked at to understand this nanoscale thermal transport in thermoelectrics is lead telluride, and it's a sort of sister compound tin telluride. These are probably the most classic thermoelectrics material you might think of. Uh, the lead telluride is one of the best ones uh, still. It is currently used in the Mars Curiosity rover, as I pointed out earlier. And the reason is that it's got a high figure of merit, uh, reaching above two. This is kind of the state of the art. Uh, and the reason why it's got this high thermal conductivity is that intrinsically it's got a low thermal conductivity. The thermal conductivity in this case is only about two watts per meter per Kelvin room temperature. So why is it that low? Uh, especially this is surprising because this is a very simple rock cell structure, very high symmetry structure. And even in a pristine single crystal of the structure, you don't have much heat going across. So what is happening? So we sorted out by um, looking at the phonon dispersions in this material, uh, both the experiments on the left and the simulations on the right. And what we found is that even though this material crystallizes in this very simple structure, it's actually not far from an instability. It almost wants to distort to a lower symmetry structure, which would be rhombohedral. And you can see that in the phonon dispersions by looking at the transverse optic modes. So these are the same modes I had in one of the animations in the beginning. These transverse optic modes here correspond to the uh, upper branch uh, at higher energies here. The lower ones are the acoustic modes. And you notice that these optic modes have got this pronounced dip here towards the middle of the, the panel. Uh, this is what we call the center of the Brillouin zone, or gamma point. If this frequency were to go all the way to zero, that would mean that this pattern of vibration would freeze in the structure, so it would distort the structure. Uh, so it is not quite zero, but it's still pretty low frequency, so that means we're not far from this instability. And as a result of this, the phonons feel an unharmonic potential, and this leads to a lot of interactions between different phonon modes. So these optical modes serve to actually scatter the acoustic phonons beneath them. And this mechanism suppresses the thermal conductivity by about a factor of five. 
So this was quite surprising at the time because in a lot of heat transfer textbooks, you might learn that only acoustic phonons matter when you want to understand thermal conductivity. Uh, but this is really not true. Actually, we find that the optical phonons can be quite useful to suppress the heat propagation from the acoustic phonons. Actually, this leads to a sort of a, a new direction in the thermoelectrics community to look for materials that are close to ferroelectric instabilities as a means to suppress their thermal conductivity. Uh, more recently, we also looked in the time resolve domain at the atomic vibrations in these materials. So this was using the uh, free electron laser at SLAC. This is really a fascinating uh, uh, facility where you can freeze the atomic motions you know, on a terrace time scale, and uh, you can track them in time. Uh, this is really a, an exciting time for these uh, time resolved X-ray measurements. So we can take these pictures here at certain times after we pump the system with an ultrafast laser uh, to see what the distribution of scattering intensity is like. So this helped us understand the bonding in this material. And then the last material I want to briefly talk about is another thermoelectric material, a new one though. So uh, I talked about the very classic lead telluride. This tinselenide is a little bit its counterpart. It's one of the newest materials that are known to achieve this kinds of uh, figure of merits above two. And this was discovered by a, a group at uh, Northwestern uh, Mercury Canad Cities. And it was found that it's got this very high uh, figure of merit, although it depends on which direction you look at uh, in a crystal because this is not a cubic structure. And it comes in part from having this very low thermal conductivity, a factor of two or more lower than in the case of lead telluride. And so now we're, we're trying to uh, build up our understanding and sort of uh, having some rules of thumb and trying to relate um, our understanding to the chemistry of these different materials. So, the question is how we can understand the anomonicity in those different compounds in terms of their chemistry and the electronic bonding. So what can we learn about how the bonding of electrons uh, can generate strong anomonicity leading to low thermal conductivities to improve those materials? So we looked at the details of the, the structure of this material. It changes with temperature. There's a phase transition also around 800 degrees Kelvin where it uh, goes from a high symmetry phase at high temperature, higher symmetry phase, and the lower symmetry phase when we cool down below the phase transition. So if you look at the coordination polyhedron for the tin atom in gray here, and its first nearest neighbor selenium atoms, you can see that the tin atom at high temperature sits in the middle of the square of four seleniums. But when you cool down, it offsets to one side spontaneously. So there's this distortion that sets in uh, and this actually comes about from the anharmonic properties of the potential, as I'll illustrate in a second here. This phase transition is also a continuous type of phase transition, so it's what we call a second-order phase transition. And so we measured the, uh, the phonon dispersions in the different crystallographic directions. Once again, we compare with our DFT simulations. We get pretty amazing agreement, actually, which tells us how accurate the first principles acquisitions can be. And then we can use those first principles calculations in turn to look at the bonding and understand how uh, the bonding in the material leads to this strong anomonicity. So this is illustrated here. We look at the different terms in the inter interatomic potential. We isolate the uh, non-quadratic part, which we call uh, cubic force constants. And then we relate those with the actual structure of the material. And we find that there's a critical distance for um, uh, triplets of atoms here contributing these cubic forces around six angstroms. And this distance of six angstroms, so if we include interactions corresponding to this distance here, then we see the thermal conductivity as a big drop. And also the anomonicity goes up around the same length scale. So this tells us that there's something critical happening here. And actually, this is related to what's called uh, resonant bonding. So there's this PP bonding. Um, uh, happening in the material, and it's predominantly along this direction here, and this contributes this large third order term or cubic force constants uh, leading to the strong anomalisty. I'll skip this. So, if we look now um, pictorially, uh, we, we may want to see how the electronic density changes between the two phases to have more of a direct sense of the chemistry, if you will. <coughs> 
So we can plot what's called the electron localization function and compare it between the high temperature, high symmetry CMCM phase and the lower temperature, lower symmetry PNMA phase. So once again, you can see that at high temperature, the TIN atom sits in the middle of the square of four selenium atoms. This is in the sort of basal plane of the structure. But at low temperature, the tin offsets to one side. And so chemically, what uh, this means is that you have this non-saturated half-filled bonds at high temperature, uh, which are the same with these four atoms. But the tin atom may choose to offset to one side and form two full bonds and effectively break the two other bonds. And this leads to a lowering of the energy of the system. So now we can track how the energy changes as we go through this distortion. So this uh, energy here corresponds to this structure, this energy there to that structure. And you can see that by forming these two full bonds and breaking those over two, you achieve a lowering in the total energy of the system. But of course, the tin atom could choose to go on the other side, right? This is symmetric. So on the other side, you must have another minimum. So you have this kind of a double wear potential in the structure which is a consequence of the bonding in that, uh, in that material. So really, this, this kind of, uh, we might call this a, a Yantelier or Pyros type of instability again, this is what's leading to this strong anomonicity in a potential energy surface, and ultimately to the low thermal conductivity of this material. So we really achieve, by combining the uh, first principle simulations with our measurements here, more fundamental understanding of how uh, the, the chemical bonding in the electronic structure can give us phonon properties which are useful for achieving low thermal conductivity and better thermoelectrics. So the overall uh, takeaway from this lecture is that uh, it's important to understand atomic dynamics in materials in order to rationalize both the thermodynamics and thermal transport. And uh, by combining experiments and simulations, we can really uh, achieve a great amount of uh, detailed knowledge. And this can point out to uh, uh, new strategies to design new materials with better properties for either thermoelectrics or other types of applications. And I want to emphasize that, once again, there's a great amount of complementarity between the uh, experiments and the simulations, and also that um, there's a lot more we could do with the types of data we measure at the user facilities, and I hope to collaborate with more of you uh, to maybe use uh, advanced data processing techniques uh, maybe machine learning to be able to identify features in those data sets. Also maybe using super resolution to uh, correct for some of the effects in the data or achieve better uh, resolution in the analysis. And so there's really a lot we can do to better understand at the atomic level the properties of these materials. And so uh, before I, I uh, close uh, things up here, I'd like to acknowledge my collaborators. Of course, uh, we have a great number of collaborators on these different studies. Uh, I can't really go through every single one of them, but in particular, I'd like to acknowledge uh, several postdocs who have worked with me uh, both at Oak Ridge and um, now also at Duke on these various projects. And um, several of them have uh, gone on to take faculty positions of their own at various institutions. Uh, we're quite happy that the students are also picking up now uh, the knowledge about how to do both these experiments and simulations. And I'd like to acknowledge uh, also my collaborators at Oak Ridge National Lab and other institutions. I look forward to collaborating with more of you at Duke. I'd like to uh, also acknowledge my sources of funding. So thank you for your attention, and I'll be happy to answer any questions you might have. <laughs>